welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by Last Man Standing with Loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simeon, and on this edition, we'll be looking back at the 2-0 victory over Napoli in the first leg of our Europa League quarterfinal. A fantastic result and a great performance too. Uh, lots of, of positives now to take with us into the second leg in Naples next week. We'll be dissecting that fixture right here. Now let's begin by looking at Unai Emery's initial team selection. It was Petr Cech in goal, a back three of Nacho Monreal, Laurent Koscielny and Socrates. A midfield pivot of Lucas Torreira and Aaron Ramsey with Ainsley Maitland-Niles and Saad Kalasinac operating as the wing-backs. Mesut Ozil was selected in his preferred number 10 position with Alexander Lacazette and Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang leading the line. Now my initial thoughts when I saw this lineup. Um, was one of excitement. I thought this is a real uh, aggressive team selection by Unai Emery and I was kind of glad to see it. But on the other hand, I was a little bit worried and, and my fears obviously have been dispelled since. But at the time, I was a little bit concerned that maybe Aaron Ramsey in particular wouldn't be as disciplined as he needed to be. Maybe he wouldn't support Lucas Torreira as much as he would need and maybe Napoli would dominate in the midfield area. But that wasn't to be the case. Credit to Aaron Ramsey. He did his job fantastically well um, and he, he did, deserves a lot of praise for that um, because, you know, it's not easy to get up and down the pitch and uh, provide support for your colleague, but also get into those goal-scoring positions as he did for the first goal. Um, Lacazette and Aubameyang were both selected up top and for me, that is the way to go. You know, we've got two world-class strikers and we often, at times, don't play both of them. And I get that it's tactical uh, a lot of the time. But for me, where you can, you need to be playing both of them. And I thought Mesa Ozil also done a pretty good job, particularly in the first half, of picking up the ball in little pockets of space and pulling out to the left, pulling out to the right uh, and causing... Uh, the Napoli midfield some problems. They didn't know who to pick up, where to pick them up. Uh, and, you know, that adds to, obviously, the effect. Now, I thought Lacazette and Aubameyang, what they did really well was they work these channels. And that's obviously something that Unai Emery has instructed because it's not something we used to see last season. Um, Unai Emery instructs Lacazette and Aubameyang to get into those channels in between the fullbacks and the centre-backs, particularly when you're playing against the back four. This is really, really effective because you get in those channels and you ultimately pull the centre-backs uh, a little bit wider than they'd like to be. The centre-backs are kind of in a catch-22 because do they go with you? Or do they stay in their position? And often that creates space for the likes of Mesut Ozil or Aaron Ramsey and Lucas Torreira for, you know, we saw the example for their goals to get into those positions on the edge of the penalty area undetected until the very last minute. And that's where it's really, really effective for me. So I was really pleased with that. Um, We've seen the strikers split before. This wasn't the first time, but it's something that's becoming more and more and more effective. And I love to see it. Um, my only concern uh, was it came in the second half where we was a little bit um, exposed in the area in between, I thought, Lauren Koscielny and Nacho Monreal. So kind of down our left-hand side, I thought that Napoli identified that area as a problem and were playing balls over the top of Nacho Monreal um, quite frequently for Lorenzo Insigne and then Adam Unas when he came on to run onto. That for me was a real issue for us in the second half. Fortunately, our centre-backs communicated very well. Uh, Lauren Koscielny often coming across to support Nacho Monreal there. But that should be a warning to us for the second leg. Our wing-backs have to protect a little bit more. And I know that Serge Kolasinac is so effective getting forward. I know that Ainsley Maitland-Niles is not naturally a defender, but... In Naples, those guys have to be a little bit more protective of that back three because if they're not, Napoli will ex expose us there. Sorry, I, I've always said that a back three is not wide enough uh, to cover the full width of a pitch. And you saw that when those balls were coming over the top. I get it. You know, I get the reason we play that way and it's it has so many positives to it. But if teams are going to stretch us and work those channels, then the wing backs have to get back and protect we weren't made to pay for it, fortunately. Um, and, and, you know, we missed some chances of our own too. So it's not to make a huge point of it, but it's a little bit of a warning sign going into that second leg in Naples and something that Unai Emery, in my opinion, needs to address. It only took us... 
15 minutes to break the deadlock. And it was exactly what I described in that team selection thing. As I've mentioned, um, you know, the striker splitting, creating that gaping hole in between, uh, in front of the Napoli defence, sorry, and, and allowing Aaron Ramsey to break forward. It was some lovely interchangeable play. I think Ozil Lacazette, Maitland Niles and then Ramsey uh, with the finish. So it was lovely football. Um, some describe it as Emery ball. It was great stuff. Uh, fantastic to see. And of course, Arsenal took the lead as a result of it. It wasn't long then before we got a second. Uh, Lucas Torreira doing what Aaron Ramsey had done in that last move and breaking from the midfield, uh, exposing that gap uh, in front of the Napoli defence, popping up a lovely little Cruyff turn um, and then fired towards goal. And I think it was off Khalidou Koulibaly, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but it came off of him uh, and totally wrong-footed Mere in the Napoli goal. And all of a sudden, Arsenal were 2 nil up and in dreamland. I do think in the second half, you know, there were people that were uh, speaking around me that were a little bit worried about the fact that Napoli had seemingly gained control in the second half. I don't think that was the case. I think that Arsenal had gone out in the second half to be a little bit more conservative, look to play on the break. And that's absolutely the right thing to do, given the situation, you know. A 2-0 win is a fantastic result. But if you concede a goal and you get caught out on the counter-attack, all of a sudden 2-1 is a bad result. And that's how things can change in the, in Europe uh, with this away goals rule. It's such a huge factor in these ties that it's so important that you don't concede one. And I thought Arsenal did very well uh, to be... What's the word? To, to, to find the right balance between attacking in the second half when the opportunity was right, but also not leaving ourselves exposed defensively. We did have a, a couple of chances in the second half. I remember one that fell to Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, but in particular, there was one very, very good chance that fell to Aaron Ramsey and he put it over the bar. And perhaps if you're thinking about which of your attacking midfielders or which of your midfielders you want that to fall to, you probably would have picked Aaron Ramsey. So just really bad luck. But Aaron Ramsey, for me, was fantastic uh, in that game. You know, he, he did everything. He got forward. As I've already mentioned, he defended well. He got the goal. Um, he popped up in those threatening positions. And he's probably already made a few friends at Juventus after that goal against Napoli, uh, too. So, um, you know, it's going to be a big miss. And we've spoken about this before. Don't want to get into it too heavily. But Aaron Ramsey, um, you know, he, he's... He, it's sad that he's going, but he's been a top professional. He gives his all every time he plays. And for that, he deserves immense credit and the respect of Arsenal fans. And I'm sure when the time comes and he, he plays his last game in an Arsenal shirt, he will get the send-off that he deserves. And that would be absolutely right. As I've already mentioned too, I think the manager deserves immense credit for that performance last night. I thought that his team selection, as I've already said, was brave. It was bold, but it paid off. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's pleasing to see when it does pay off. Naturally, he's going to have critics when things don't pay off and when things don't come off the way he'd planned. But yesterday, I thought Arsenal executed his game plan to a T. Um, I think that when you compare Premier League and Serie A sides and uh, you know, as you guys will know that follow me, I watch a lot of Serie A football. We do the Simply Serie A show on a weekly basis. So um, I have a huge interest in that league and I, and I like to think that my knowledge of that league is better than most, um, most Arsenal fans anyway. Um, but what I will say is the one thing that's very clear when you compare the two leagues is the intensity at which the game is played. Now, Napoli are not worse than us technically but Napoli are a lot less physical. They're a lot less intense in the way they go about their play. And I think Unai Emery was right to make a thing of that in this tie. He was right to make a point of Arsenal starting fast, playing the likes of Aaron Ramsey and Lucas Torreira, who are probably a little bit more explosive than some of the other options he had available to him. Guendouzi or Elneny, for example. Um, you know, I, I think the intensity of which we played with was the real difference and, and Napoli just couldn't cope with it. Uh, it took them time to settle into the game and by the time they settled, Arsenal were a goal to the good. So, you know, that was great on Unai Emery's part and I think that's the big difference between the two leagues and, and, and why Premier League sides probably have the advantage over the likes of Napoli and other Serie A sides. Um, I think as well, you know, Unai Emery showed... Um, and, and I know I've already said this, I'm kind of going back over old ground, but Unai Emery showed um, the pragmatism to lay off a little bit in the second half, to sit that little bit deeper. And, uh, you know, Napoli did press us higher up the pitch. They did push their centre-halves higher up and, and effectively at times squeeze us into our own half. But 
we 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 didn't mind that we were okay with that because it meant that we could defend uh, as a more compact unit but also have the space to break um with the players that we did have with the Lacazettes with the Abamyangs with the Kalasinachs coming up the left hand side so i thought that worked really really well and Unai Emery deserves a lot of praise for that it's going to be really interesting now to see how he rotates and how he looks forward uh, to the game against Watford on Monday night because it's not a big turnaround Thursday to Monday. Um, you know, it could be worse. We've played a lot of Thursday, Sundays. So we've got that extra day, but it kind of eats into our time where we have to prepare for the second leg of this Europa League tie. So it's kind of swings and roundabouts. It's good on the one hand, bad on the other. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how he selects the team. I think Lauren Koscielny came back into the side and was immense and has been immense. Um, pretty much every time he's played, apart from, I would say, that comeback game against Southampton where he was poor. And that was completely understandable. He was thrown in before he was ready. But what I want to see now is how Unai Emery approaches Watford because it's not like last season. Last season, Arsene Wenger had the advantage of Arsenal being out of the league running by this point. Whereas now we're in the run for a Champions League spot via the league, but we're also in the Europa League quarterfinals. And so what do you do? Which one do you pick? Do you try and go for both? But you could end up uh, seeing both of them blow up in your face. It's a very difficult balance to find. We're now going to be without Socrates for two league games. So Watford and Crystal Palace, he is suspended for. And that means that Lauren Koscielny probably has to play. And in an ideal world, I don't think Unai Emery would have wanted him to play so many games in quick succession, given he's coming back from injury. The other question is, will Granit Xhaka be back? Um, you know, do you want to interrupt Torreira and Ramsey as a partnership? For me, I think as much as, you know, people will argue that you shouldn't, I think that Granit Xhaka and Lucas Torreira are as good a, a pairing um, as Ramsey and Torreira are. So why not make that rotation, assuming that Granit Xhaka is available for Watford and make sure that we have fresher legs going into that second leg out in Naples because that is going to be such a difficult game. Watford's going to be a difficult game too. You know, they're on great form. They've had a fantastic season. They've just beaten Wolves coming from two goals down. Not many fancied them to do that in the FA Cup semi-final. They're going to a final now. Um, so, you know, you expect them to be on the high, but there is also that danger of having hit the high that you might find yourselves uh, falling down a little bit in the uh, fixtures coming up now. And will Watford have an eye on that final? Of course they will. Will they finish any higher in the league than they are now? Probably not. But, uh, you know, Javi Grazia has been great this season and he's really made sure that they've stayed focused. And in the past, we've seen Watford sides uh, have great runs of form, start seasons brilliantly and then fade away. And I know that happened last season where, they were kind of in the top 10 for the most part. And then they slid down the table and almost went down. Um, all right, you know, not as close as some, but they were very close to the bottom three come the end of last season. Javi Gratti has done well in, in making sure that that rot doesn't happen. And so I don't expect Watford to be slacking on Monday night. It's going to be a physical clash. Troy Deeney, of course, um, our old nemesis will be right up for it. Um, you know, putting himself about putting his body on the line and, the blow for Arsenal is the fact that Socrates will be missing because Socrates for me is exactly the type of player that Troy Deeney doesn't want to face. Troy Deeney wants to bully people and he made that uh, a point of that. Uh, I think it was last season and he picked on certain players and, you know, we went on and on about that. I wasn't happy. Um, but Socrates is not the type of player to let you do that. And so Troy Deeney won't be looking forward to that challenge. Troy Deeney looks forward to the players that he can put you know, that he can put in their place, that he can bully, that he can shoulder barge, that he can um, have his way with wind up. Socrates is the pillar of shithousery at Arsenal at the moment. So he's not the player that Troy Deeney would want to face. And unfortunately for us, he picked up that yellow card at Everton and he's now going to miss um, Watford and Crystal Palace, which is a big blow, a big blow indeed. Now, I know I've digressed a little bit uh, looking ahead to the Watford game, but let's go back to Napoli for a moment as I'm going to give you guys my player ratings for this one. I want to hear you guys' player ratings too. Leave them in the comments below. Tweet us at Chronicles underscore AFC. But mine are as follows. Petr Cech, seven. Uh, Socrates, seven. Uh, Laurent Koscielny, eight. Nacho Monreal, seven. Um... Ainsley Maitland-Niles gets a seven for me as well. I thought he started a little bit nervy once again, but that was understandable following the performance at Everton. So uh, seven for him. Um, 
Say Kalasinac, seven and a half. I thought he got forward really well, as he always does, and he just gives us so much on that left-hand side. I thought Aaron Ramsey deserved an eight. Lucas Torreira, seven and a half. Um, Mesa Ozil gets a seven for me. Um, oh, Alexander Lacazette probably gets a seven for me as well, and as does Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang uh, for the work that they done. I know it wasn't their greatest games, but they put that work in those channels and helped uh, a great deal. Right, just looking over at Twitter, uh, we put a tweet out, of course, last night after the game, asking for your comments and questions. Going to go through a few here. The first one comes from Graham Sutherland. Why is it that Aubameyang cannot get into the game? That's a bit of a negative, but the rest is all positive from last night. We still need a goal next week, but I'd play with one striker and leave Ozil and Aubameyang on the bench. Emery outthought Ancelotti. Well done to him. I agree with you. Uh, Emery did... Uh, outmaneuver Carlo Ancelotti yesterday and Carlo Ancelotti is a fantastic manager so that's no uh, or that's nothing to be sniffed at I should say so fair play to Unai Emery he deserves a lot of praise um, following from last night why is it that Aubameyang cannot get into the game and I kind of agree with you and and there are times when I look at Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and the way he's on the periphery of the game and I think to myself you've got to do more you can do more but then I look at his goal scoring record and then I think to myself Am I being harsh? So it's a tough one with Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. Let us know what you guys think as well in the comments. And of course, you can tweet us at Chronicles underscore AFC. For me, Aubameyang can do more, Graham. I completely agree with you. But I think his goal scoring record speaks for itself and kind of gives him not a free pass, but a little bit of leeway when fans are criticising him. I do genuinely believe that. So... Um, yeah, but great point, though. Great point. I, I do feel the same. Uh, I am Keenan on Twitter says, I feel like we're about to see a second wave of Torreira. He gives us so much control in the midfield and he's just so quick on the ball. This isn't a question, clearly, but love the show. Uh, thank you very much, Keenan. Much appreciated. And, you know, fingers crossed we do see that second wave of Lucas Torreira because... He, um, you know, at the beginning of the season, he wasn't getting in the, in the every week. Then he had established himself, did really, really well. I then felt that his performances dropped off a little bit. But after what we saw last night, um, you know, it looks like, you know, if he can be back to his best for the running, that'll be a huge, huge boost to this Arsenal side, of course. Uh, Yoke the Joker says, should have been 3-0, but glad we got a 2-0 lead at least. I agree with you, mate. There is a little bit of regret there in the sense that we didn't completely kill the tie off. But if you had told me before the game that Arsenal were going to win 2-0, I would have bitten your arm off and, and been absolutely over the moon with that. Um... That's it from your comments and questions this week. We've got a competition that's still running um, and it's for your chance to win a singing Arsenal scarf courtesy of the 12th men. Uh, follow them on Twitter at T underscore T underscore M underscore 2018 um, for your chance to win uh, a fantastic prize. All you've got to do is follow them, follow us, retweet the tweet that is pinned on our profile and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Um, there are two up for grabs, so two of you will be winning this fantastic prize. We're going to keep the competition running a little bit longer. I'll be honest, I thought more of you would enter it, considering it's free to enter and the prize is a good one. But, you know, let's keep it running for another week and see how it goes. The more people, uh, the better. And, you know, maybe we can get more prizes in from various donors as well and we can keep it going and keep you guys interested too. Uh, thanks for watching and listening depending on whether you're on YouTube or, or on the audio. Uh, really, really do appreciate your support. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, review if you're listening on iTunes. That's very important too. Um, and don't forget to check out our sponsors, loserpool.com. You can play Last Man Standing for free at the moment and you have the chance to win £1,000. So head over there, sign up and get playing. It's a great game. We'll be back on Tuesday after the Watford fixture, of course. We'll be looking back on that one. Uh, so until then, guys, have a great day. Enjoy your weekends uh, and spend some time with your family, seeing as we're stress-free from the Arsenal for a couple of days at least.